Hello, I'm Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS guy, and I'm live streaming from Lake Tahoe, California and Nevada. And we are again blessed to have with us Dr. Art Jenkins III, who's a great neurosurgeon and a great thinker on TOS. He's affiliated with two of the best universities in New York, Mount Sinai and NYU. And today, Dr. Jenkins is gonna talk about how to select the best surgeon for the best outcome. Art, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Scott, always a pleasure to be here in, uh, in this uh, TOS corner, so to speak. Um, this is an area that has um, you know, come alive in, uh, in terms of the, the number of people who have suffered significantly without getting um, adequate treatment, uh, both from the primary doctors through the pain management doctors to the surgeons. Uh, it is actually very hard to find um, the right surgeon for a problem like this. Uh, one of the issues, uh, so first, before we get started, I, I, I've, got no, um, I've got no conflicts of interest to, to report. I have no uh, relationships in industry that are relevant other than the fact that, yeah, I'm a surgeon, I treat TOS. And so, you know, take what I say with that grain of salt. So what is TOS or thoracic outlet syndrome? Um, it is a collection of diagnoses. It's no one treatment uh, and no one uh, condition, uh, which makes it more complicated. And some people, some, some physicians tend to shy away from making diagnoses that are complicated. Um, it involves a, the confluence of the chest, the cervical and thoracic spine and the shoulder each of which is an incredibly complicated anatomic area. And therefore the confluence of all of these is, is, uh, is also even more, that much more complicated. Uh, the outlet uh, that we speak about is where the nerves and the neurovascular bundle leave the chest area to go out the arm. So the anatomy in particular involves this triangular area here. Um, and it involves the, the nerves, it involves the arteries, it involves the muscles, it involves the bones, it involves the veins. And we're learning more and more that it involves many small structures as well as some of the bigger structures. So when you look at the area boundary, bounded by all of these structures, it, it, it's an overlap of actually multiple specialties as well as uh, multiple clinical diagnoses. So, and it's because the symptoms vary significantly. It's not like sciatica. Uh, it's not like a pneumonia where people have pretty classic symptoms. This is a, a whole spectrum of neurologic and vascular findings that are often perplexing if you don't understand the primary issues. So they'd be geared towards what the problem is. So you can have entrapment by the first rib um, in between where the normal rib might be. You can have impingement where the, the, one of the chest muscles that controls the position of the shoulder and the shoulder blade, the pectoralis minor. And these result when there's instability, the shoulder and the shoulder drops down, it essentially puts tension on the neurovascular bundle as it goes down and then when the arm goes up, the nerves get pinched and bowstrung underneath that. Scaling muscles can sometimes become overgrown, especially in people who are doing weightlifting. Um, and that these muscles have gotten bigger than normal. They can pinch nerves between them. Cervical ribs are a congenital anomaly where you have an extra rib. Uh, and in some cases you can have an extra rib on each side. Um, and these can, cause severe pain because they were never meant to be there. So this region wasn't designed to have an extra interloper in there. So it can pinch the nerves, it can even pinch and damage the arteries. Fibers bands are structures that come off of these, any of these structures, and then there are a number of other types of compression. Um, it's important when working up these conditions to evaluate for other neurologic and, and orthopedic conditions that are in this area because not everything that looks like TOS is TOS and not everything that looks like a shoulder slap tear or a rotor, rotator cuff injury is a rotator cuff injury. And it's important to be able to differentiate between the two. 
Now, surgery, generally speaking, is reserved for those who have failed conservative treatment. And what's conservative treatment? Physiotherapy, strengthening up those muscles that support the shoulder. A lot of these problems that we see in TOS are caused by instability of the shoulder blade, causing abnormal position of all of these structures. And so if we can strengthen those muscles and lift up the shoulders a little bit, then maybe we can start to see uh, an improvement um, in the physical symptoms. Bracing has been used uh, for uh, many years and, and can, between bracing and, and specialized taping, can help give some physical external support to that same shoulder and shoulder blade, keeping it elevated so the pressure doesn't get on the neurovascular bundle. Um, there have been calls for and tests of and trials of various types of injections, Botox and hydrodissection. These are different pain management techniques to try to alleviate the problem. Generally speaking, um, these are temporizing rather than curative uh, treatments, uh, and they will manage the problem for a while until the benefits wear off. Does that mean that there's no value to these treatments? No, it may mean that they are an interim step as maybe one is being prepared for surgery or if they are an intervening step to try to give some relief while you are trying to get one of the other two treatments to be implemented adequately to see if you can avoid surgery. So what are the surgical treatments? Well, they, once again, you gotta make the right diagnosis first um, if the diagnosis is a cervical rib problem, well, then you got to take out the cervical rib. Um, and they, those are very specific uh, uh, techniques. Uh, I've invented one and others have, have invented them. Um, but you really, it's a completely different treatment than treating any of the other types of problems. Um, if the problem is in the, the, the main area, which is probably 95% 90 to 95% of all TOS cases, the problem is somewhere around the first rib. And so if you've gotten to the point where you're just not getting any better, first rib resection is still the gold standard. How it's done though, there are many different approaches and then there are different flavors to each approach. Um, there are transaxillary approaches. Those are commonly done by the vascular surgeons. Uh, infrascapular approaches can be done by any one of a number of different treatment uh, specialists. The suprascapular approach uh, is a less exposure approach, but it actually has higher complications in many studies than some of the other two because you're diving down on the main structures before you get to the first rib. So you actually encounter the, um, the artery, the vein, the nerves prior to getting to the rib itself because um, you're coming right down on them. Um, and then there are intrapleural approaches uh, that have been uh, advocated. And some of them are more minimally invasive. Um, they involve either robotic or uh, video assisted uh, thoracoscopic approaches. Um, and then uh, there's even been recently a proposal to do a pure posterior approach, um, which is similar to my cervical rib resection. Um, the pectoralis minor syndrome requires a completely different treatment. You just go in as minimally invasively as you can do safely. And that comes down to what the surgeon's skill set is um, to just cut the tendon of the pectoralis minor. Um, it is a one of the 17 muscles that stabilize the scapula. So cutting a tendon, essentially cutting the muscle uh, will mean that muscle isn't helping stabilize the shoulder anymore. Um, it may be a temporizing treatment more than a permanent cure, um, but if it at least alleviates the problem where you are now, then, then that's better than not being treated. So the most important steps in determining the right treatment are, once again, making the right diagnosis. Not all TOS is the same. You've got to make sure that the clinician is aware of all the different types and understands the anatomic uh, correlates, that understands the physical exam findings uh, as well as, in some cases, the right radiographic or electrophysiologic testing that needs to be done. Um, the next step is to make sure that you go down the right treatment path to see if you even need a surgeon. And most, many people won't. 
So it's better to get that first than find a surgeon first who may very well say, well, if you're coming to a surgeon, you must want surgery. Once you get to the point where you've adequately been evaluated and non-surgically treated and you still need a surgical evaluation, well, then it's time to find the surgeon who understands the condition and really is kept up on the condition. Um, back in the 1980s, a neurologist proposed to reduce the number of people who got thoracic outlet surgery. He proposed and, and has managed to get a lot of people to follow him along without any evidence to support his assertion that this was a valid description. He call, started calling some types of TOS disputed TOS, which naturally, if you call a condition disputed, you're naturally going to make people think it's not real. Um, and this is really should just be called EMG negative TOS. So you wanna make sure your surgeon understands the difference between disputed TOS, which is not a real diagnosis, but is just a pejorative term um, that is targeting early TOS. Um, and then what surgical uh, techniques do they use? Um, which one of the primary approaches, if you're doing a first rib, proposing a first rib resection, which one do they do the most? Which ones are they, have they done at all? Um, do they, have they developed or are they using any minimally invasive techniques to reduce the impact? Um, are they doing any neuromonitoring? Are they doing any other physiologic monitoring during the operation to make sure the procedure is being done fully safely? Um, are they up on the latest techniques or are they practicing the same techniques that were taught to them by their mentor 30 years ago? Um, these are important questions to ask. Um, can they tell you what your particular risks are? For example, do they understand if you have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, what impact that has upon your likelihood of getting through the surgery without any complications? And if so, which ones are you likely to get? Um, do they understand um, what the various issues are that you're facing uh, clinically to make sure that the treatment that they chose is really treating those problems and not just treating, you know, the, the MRI that they have. Um, now, one of the things, the biggest problem I have in, encountered in treating patients with TOS is people are coming to me from all over the country because they don't have a local doctor they, they have found to do the surgery or to work, even work them up in some cases. The, um, this is not an insignificant issue. If you live in, you know, a, a place that is a hundred miles from a major medical center and you have limited access and your insurance won't let you be treated outside of your state, you know, it's, it may come down to having to, to make do with the, sur the best surgeon you can find. Um, but there are options um, because there are different types of surgeons who do this treatment. And if you shop around, you may be able to find one who can at least talk to other surgeons who have done it and help you out. Um, but in many of these cases, if you don't have anybody in your treatment area who is skilled in the technique, most insurances will pay for you to go outside of your treatment area um, as long as you've documented that you've done your due diligence and trying to stay within network or within region. So who does treat these? Well, there's a lot of different types. And, and as I said, there's an overlap. Um, vascular surgeons, thoracic surgeons, neurosurgeons, and generally hand surgeons, which is a subset of both orthopedic surgeons and plastic surgeons. Um, both plastic surgeons and orthopedic surgeons can often subspecialize in, in a specialty called hand. Um, and sometimes they'll even take each other's fellowships. Uh, but the idea is you want to have somebody who has extensive knowledge of the neurovascular anatomy and the regional orthopedic anatomy uh, rather than just, you know, any general surgeon or uh, a neurosurgeon or a thoracic surgeon or vascular surgeon who normally does other stuff. So what do we know about th these types of surgeries in general? Well, not a lot. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of national data about TOS. Um, 
there was a recent study using a national database that's from the American College of Surgeons. It's called the NSQIP or the NISQIP database. Um, and this is a very good database, but it has significant limitations. Um, but what the, the database dive that was done uh, the, back in 2017 showed was that about 90% of TOS procedures in their database were actually done by vascular surgeons, which is mostly what people see around the country. This is, there are more a lot more vascular surgeons doing this procedure than other types of specialties. Uh, and the, the complication rates in general are very low, um, but there is about an 8.6% chance, chance in this database survey of needing to come back for either a second operation or for a complication related to the first operation, uh, which is not insignificant. Uh, but there are major limitations in this study. The first is that this study probably represents about or less than 5% of all the surgeries done for TOS during that same time period. Uh, so it's not a great representation and it may be more of what's known as an academic uh, gear because this only represented about, at its most was about 500 hospitals when there are about 5,000 in America. Uh, and so the, um, it tends to be more the academic centers and academic centers are great for some things, and you know there, there are they have faced challenges in other areas. Um, one of which is, you know, it's it's great because this is where all the residents go to get trained, and all the fellows go to get trained. They go to academic centers, but sometimes, you know, if the residents and the fellows are participating in the process, you know, there are issues with that as well. So those complications. Um, you know, maybe uh, correlating with that. And it's so it's really hard to draw a conclusion whether these are high or lower than the actual general uh, population. Um, so it's, it's interesting. It's nice to know that there are a lot of them out there, but it's not as thorough. When you're interviewing your surgeon, uh, let's say you've gotten to the point where you've hit the first two, checked the first two boxes. You're, you've made the right, we've made the right diagnosis. You've done your due diligence. You've tried to avoid surgery. Now it's time to figure out what surgery needs to be done to, because you're just getting worse and worse in spite of non-surgical treatment. You gotta make sure your surgeon understands how to interpret the modern anatomy that's being done, who knows how to identify all these structures on these MRIs, who knows how to look at some of these three-dimensional reconstructions and to understand what's going on. Uh, I actually, I love doing these 3D reconstructions. I have a program that takes CAT scan data and lets me um, make my own um, 3D model. Um, and so um, this to me helps me to do the surgical planning, helps me to identify where the problem really is located. Um, because as you can see here, uh, on this um, image, as it moves around, um, you can see you get different perspectives. You can see where the arteries, the veins, um, and in some cases infer where the nerves are being compressed. Uh, and in some cases, um, you can actually learn things from how, you, how to position patients even better. Um, like for example, this is a 3D model that I made recently which actually had one arm down and one arm up. And you can actually see that as you roll, as you lift this arm up, you actually roll the clavicle out of the way, exposing more of the first rib, which will allow you to have a better exposure. Uh, now, this is also the position where many patients are symptomatic. So this has to be done in conjunction with the neuromonitoring and neurophysiologic monitors to look at the blood flow in the arm. Um, but if you can combine all of these data together, uh, you can position safely and effectively and really make the surgery less invasive uh, and more effective to get out enough of, in this particular case, we're, uh, we're looking at both the first rib here, but we're also looking at the cervical ribs that are present um, as well. So the, these 3D data, are, I find, you know, to be a really big help and hopefully your surgeon will understand how to interpret these types of things. Well, you need to make sure that the treatment, the surgery doesn't make other conditions worse. Um, 
first rib resection won't help pectoralis minor syndrome or cervical ribs. Um, you have to understand that sometimes the, if you delay the treatment in VTOS too long, you can have recurrent clotting and thrombosis and, and you're just not going to get better. And arterial TOS really requires treatment of an aneurysm or the arterial stenosis, and it might need to be stented at the same time. So if the problem is originally from scapular instability, we need, we as surgeons need to make sure that after the surgery, you're getting all the physiotherapy to re-stabilize that scapula. It's not, none of this exists in a vacuum. So you got to make sure that your surgeon understands um, what I like to call surgical planning in fo the fourth dimension, which involves the evolution of your process. So does your surgeon understand where you've been? How did you get to this position? Was it from an injury? Was it from a gradual progression? Is it because of an underlying condition you have? Um, how did it be develop in the first place? And then second, what's it gonna look like one, two, five, and 10 years from now? What, based upon both the surgery and your underlying anatomy and your underlying physiology, what's your likely recovery and further progression in the neurologic and neurovascular condition going to be. And so if you, the surgery doesn't take your next steps into account, if it isn't an adequate decompression in all the key places where compression might re reoccur, you're setting yourself up for, for failure. Whereas if you do too much surgery, you're exposing the patient to more risks that have no value. So understanding all of these things, not just this is the way it is now, but what's it going to look like in five years is really part of picking the right surgeon. And the next question is, how do they even measure a good outcome? Uh, presumably, you're going to need to follow up with this surgeon for months, if not years afterwards. How do they tell whether you're even any better after the operation? Are they using a database to record their patient information? How are they evaluating you pre-op? How are they going to evaluate you post-op? Um, do they learn from other surgeons? Do they compare outcomes with other surgeons to learn what they can do better? Um, or you know, do they even have that, that mentality every day, I want to be better than I was the day before, so that what they did five years ago really shouldn't be good enough when the rest of the techniques and technology around them are improving? Um, so you really got to keep up with it. So where do we go from here? Um, your ideal surgeon, which you hopefully are getting when you're interviewing, um, will take the time to listen to you, to your, or assuming you are the, that you are the patient or that you are a patient looking at this, um, that they will perform a detailed physical exam on you, make different measurements that are quantifiable. They'll order the right imaging, the right clinical testing, um, and in some cases, they may even go a step beyond and, and look into what the next generation of clinical testing is. Um, then, and that's a, that's a subject that we can talk about in another, uh, another talk is what, where is the future uh, analysis and treatment options for this. Uh, but for the where we are now, um, it, this is, you know, their EMGs are not terribly specific or sensitive. Um, and we know that from doing EMG analysis in many other neurologic conditions, uh, you know, EMG negative TOS is still TOS. It's not a dispute as to whether it's TOS. Um, and so are they keeping up on the better modeling of the condition? Do they know where, where the next, next year's treatment are going to be, not just what they did 30 years ago? Um, and can they explain to you all the different surgical approaches, as well as all of the different diagno diagnoses that exist and what you have and why they're going to treat you and why this is the best way for you. They have to explain to you in a way that makes sense to you why they chose the one that they want to do for you. And your ideal surgeon may not be just one surgeon. Um, for example, I work collaboratively with a whole bunch of other surgeons uh, including thoracic, vascular, neuro, hand surgeon. We actually have a consortium that we developed 
Um, and we're, I'm collaborating not just with non-surgical uh, specialists, but other surgical specialists. And in many cases, I do these surgeries with, um, for example, uh, one of the several vascular and or other types of surgeons so that we're actually working together I and mean, you have two completely different skill sets overlapping and taking care of the same patient. Um, it takes a village to take care of a patient. So uh, one of the other things that I do, we do extensive neurophysiologic testing during the operation. Um, we do in some cases, even physiologic testing, looking at blood flow, pulse oximetry, and other things to make sure that what we're doing is safe and effective. Um, it's also nice having different specialties playing in nicely in the same sandbox because it keeps you from falling in as a clinician into the trap of if you, all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, put this another way, if all you ever do is all you've ever done, all you'll ever get is all you've ever gotten. And you know, in this day and age, as technology and techniques are improving, it's just not good enough to just say, it's the same way it's been done for 30 years, because that's not good enough anymore. I thank you for your interest and attention. Um, you know, it's kind of an awkward question for one surgeon to tell you how to pick another surgeon, um, but I think it's useful for you to look at how, if I had this problem, how I would pick my surgeon. And that's, these are, this is how I would go about doing it, because I'm not going to do it on myself, but that's what I would do if I ever needed somebody else to do it. Thank you very much. Art, if I could uh, pay you the highest compliment, I waste a lot of my life reading and talking about TOS, and uh, that, that talk is just inspirational, and it raised a dozen questions in my head. This is really, really inspiring how much you think about this. <laughs> I'm going to start out with a couple of questions that I have, and we'll add some patient questions. I'm going to refer back to my notes. I had to take notes because I couldn't remember all the things you brought up. So you mentioned the overlap of specialties, and you described at the end of your talk how you've taken a constructive approach to that. How would you say the surgeons who focus dogmatically on one approach and don't take that community effort, how much would it hinder their development over a 30 or 40 year career versus how much do you think it's moved you forward in your understanding and success with TOS? I, I mean, I think it's, it's been a great experience working with other surgeons and working with other specialists. I learn things from them and they learn things from me. Um, I, in many ways, I'd have to say if you're having fun making somebody else's life better, that's a great way of life. And, you know, if you can find, if you, as speaking out to other clinicians out there, if you can find somebody else that you trust their judgment to, to work with you, um, your life, both of your lives will be better for it. Um, and I think the interest level will be better, but also the patient care will be better because you have, first, you have two skilled surgeons with different skill sets working on the same patient. I think that there's times that, you know, I've done things that my vascular colleague says, you know, I've, I've never seen that done before, but that's a great idea. I'm going to do that from now on and, and vice versa. I'm like, oh, wow, that's a, I love the way you get that retractor right in, in there safely knowing because you handle blood vessels day in, day out, you're more comfortable throwing a retractor right in the perfect tissue plane dissection. I, I'm going to start doing that now too, because now I've seen how to do it safely. Um, or sometimes it's more like, oh, and for this particular patient, that would be a bad idea. Good to know. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's having that overlap and having those, those complementary skill sets instead of identical skill sets. It, and to me, it makes all the difference in the world. So for someone to have trained the same place you did and to reinforce what you've done over and over again, may be comfortable in the moment, but it's not going to move our knowledge forward. No, it's like I said, if all you ever do is all you've ever done, all you'll ever get is all you've ever gotten. And, you know, let's face it, you know, nobody wants to go out and buy, um, I mean, maybe you'd want to buy a vintage one that's been thoroughly mint restored, but you wouldn't want to go out and buy a 30-year-old sports car 
that hasn't been changed, that's been driven every day for 30 years, but not um, updated. Or, or not updated, but if you want it, you want the fastest car out there, you're going to get the brand new top of the line sports car. Um, it's going to blow the doors off of the old one. That's true. So when you have some of these other docs asking you to justify what you do, there may be some times, and I know you personally, where you say, gee, I don't know. But a lot of times, by you're having to build your foundation and defend your position, you're stronger in that regard. Oh, for sure. A asking, having people ask you questions that you have to answer and answer thoughtfully always makes you think about it more. And, you know, I, I, I'm never afraid to say, I don't know, but let me find the answer. Or I'm also never afraid to say, you know, I was wrong about that and I've learned and now I do it differently. There you go. And that's why with this complex disease that's never been owned by any specialty or should never have been, it's so important to have this community you talked about, this community of docs, because <laughs> I think it's been proven TOS is not low hanging fruit and there are so many variants of it. And here I am preaching, but as you know, yeah. and so written, many people afflicted by it and often neglected with it. Right. So we've got an awareness problem, a lot of towns where there's no TOS surgeon and probably nobody who's diagnosing TOS. Right. And then you have this academic bias towards it, as you said, that really tends to favor one specialty. And one specialty probably doesn't have all the answers here. So I'll put it this way, it, it, it's really like walking into an ice cream shop and they may make the best chocolate ice cream in the world, but you know, after a while, you really start to say, but a Sunday with different flavors would be even better. <laughs> so I'm going to read an interrupt with a patient question now. Chris says, thank you so much for educating us, exclamation mark. What is the relationship between TOS and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome? This is a good question because you've brought this up before. Yeah, I brought it up before and, and I, I brought it up in this talk. Um, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is a hypermobility collagen vascular disorder. Um, the joints move more. Um, the stability of the shoulder is often in question. Um, it may not be as stable as many joints are. Sometimes even the, the clavicle to the sternum joint is loose. And this can cause malposition. It can cause more compression. On top of that, the blood vessels are more friable. They're more likely to be injured. Um, the flip side of that is Ehlers-Danlos syndrome patients have higher complication rates when they get surgery, period, across the board. Um, collagen is a major component of every part of the body. It's how we heal is through forming new collagen bonds. Um, the scar is the, the, the result of the maturation of different collagen fibers. Um, and if that's not forming properly, you're more likely to have wound complications. So it's important to understand um, what type of college, uh, what type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome that they have because they do come in different flavors. Um, it's important to understand what impact that will have on treatment um, because, you know, I've seen some patients with completely different they're almost their, their own unique TOS problem. Um, and understanding that and understanding it's the impact that has on the treatment options is important. So you got to make sure that your surgeon takes that into account and doesn't just say, uh, EDS, yeah, I never really heard of it. So it's no big deal, right? Um, they've got to know it is, it is a big deal and you need to make sure that your management takes that into account. Um, you might even want to have a plastic surgeon uh, manage the wound postoperatively just to be on the uh, on the lookout for for uh, for healing problems and to be proactive about almost overclosing the wound if they're if assuming you even go ahead with surgery. So Art, we've recently written and submitted a paper on this. So I'm serving you up sort of a softball, but I'll allow you to expand it as much as you are. Just take neurogenic TOS. 1956, a guy named Pete wrote a paper and said, it's too complicated. Let's call everything in this area, bang, TOS. How many types of neurogenic TOS? How many causes of neurogenic TOS are there? And how does that affect 
a surgeon who says, I've done it before, I'm going to do it again, same way. Wow. Uh, you know, I, I've never really, there's so many out there. I, I've never even thought to just figure out how many there are. Um, there are probably four or five major types and then maybe another five to 10 minor types. Um, of the four or five mi major types, there are scalenous uh, impingement. There's, uh, there's the, um, there's the costoclavicular instability. There's um, the fractures uh, of the clavicle or, or congenital anomalies of the clavicle. Um, there's uh, the pec minor syndromes. There's cervical uh, rib TOS. Um, but then there are others, many other minor problems. There's tumors, there's trauma, there's uh, hematomas. Uh, there's even phenomena where a vascular anomaly in the pelvis can cause uh, a, a problem with venous engorgement of smaller veins that then dilate. And those smaller veins compress the bigger veins or the nerves in the thoracic region. Um, and so, I mean, just the number of different interactions is, is, is legion. Um, and so you really have to look at, you know, I, I, I truly do believe that in some cases that the type of clinical symptom you're having, um, that, um, you really need to get, um, have, and take that into account in the surgical treatment and how, for how far back you go, where the compression occurs, when it occurs, um, and then start thinking in the post-operative recovery, specific muscular uh, retraining specific to the type of symptoms they're having. So in your mind, a patient who has a, a large scaling minimus muscle and a patient who has imbalance of the scapulae with costoclavicular compression, do they behave the same? Or are they both in this big category of neurogenic TOS? Well, they're certainly in the same big category um, and they they may superficially behave uh, similarly. They'll both present with arm and sometimes venous Im impingement in the arm, um, but they definitely respond to different treatments. Uh, and, you know, for example, um, they might, they, the amount of rib resection, if you get to that point that nothing else is effective, the amount of rib resection you need to do is different. Um, you really only need to get back to the anterior scalene um, level uh, if you're really just releasing a scalene triangle problem. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're doing something from costoclavicular uh, compression and instability, you got to get far enough back that your artery is cleared. And you, so that means you have to go past the, the middle scalene muscle with your rib resection, really get back to the, to the, to the curve uh, of the, the, post, the, the posterior curve of the rib um, to get adequate decompression. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. I, I, I can't stop myself from asking you all these technical questions. So I'm going to take a little break from that and go back to our program, which is how much should a patient rely on the institution a surgeon works in versus whether he or she has experience in TOS and what their experience is? In my mind, it really, it all comes down to the surgeon. Um, I mean, if you're truly in the middle of nowhere and there's one surgeon and he works in one hospital, you really don't have a lot of choice. Um, but there, the onus is upon the surgeon to make sure the hospital is providing the minimum standard of what they need to do their job. And hopefully they know enough to do what they're doing. And if they don't, they know enough to refer out to a major medical center. Um, for example, you know, there are a number of uh, hospitals in Montana that refer all their cases to the University of Washington um, that are a, a certain level of complexity and beyond. Um, so it really depends on, um, you know, it, but it, the onus is always upon the surgeon to make sure that the, that the hospital is providing the minimum standard. Um, so the and surgeon the onus, is good. So this, this, it's the surgeon's job to make sure the institution is good. Um, knowing that the institution is good, you could be go to the best institution in the world. And if you pick the surgeon who has no idea what he's doing, and he doesn't tell you that he has no idea what he's doing, you know, you're out of luck. So part of the homework for the patient deciding who their surgeon is, is 
really kind of to ignore the institution and focus on the doc. No, well, I think there's a certain implication that if you're working at an institution, you've reached a certain standard, a certain you've gotten across a certain bar. But by the same token, you're you really it's not enough just to go to a website, click on who treats TOS and say that's good enough. You've really got to actually, you know, ask your clinician to ask around, you know, talk to talk to the surgeons, talk to the anesthesiologist, talk to the neurologists who refer to these different surgeons and find out what they say about them. Who, who do they think is the best? Because ultimately it's whose patients have the best outcomes. And, you know, it might be the physiatrists who know that because they're the ones doing the rehab after the surgery. And they might know that surgeon one has great outcomes and surgeon two, you know, maybe some more meh, you know, less, less enthusiastic outcomes. That's great. There are no websites that really rank doctors that I know of in any useful way, especially for some niche like this. So yeah. that's a great approach to talk to the other docs and specialists who work with the docs. Yeah. That's great. So Michael Perani is a viewer who asked, what di <coughs> excuse me, what diagnostic procedures do you find the most useful for narrowing down the cause of TOS? Well, as far as the cause go, I first, that's the old fashioned diagnostic procedure using my ears is listening to when the, how the patient describes where they get their symptoms and answering my questions about how they get their symptoms. Second, on the physical exam, um, you know, if I compress, if I palpate in the region of the, the, um, the pec minor and that doesn't stimulate, you know, with the arm up and this, that doesn't stimulate the symptoms when the arm down, you know, all through the whole range of motion, if that doesn't trigger it, it's probably not the pec minor. Um, you know, if they get pain that radiates down the arm when I compress them in the scalene triangle, you know, that's a very different clinical guide. Um, you know, if I get EMGs and they're negative, that doesn't tell me anything. If they're positive, it tells me the problem's already so bad that there is probably some permanent nerve damage that's already been done. Yeah. Um, it's funny, you know, we are now, we were talking about this before we started, um, we're in the process of putting together a research protocol to look at somatosensory evoked potentials preoperatively as a diagnostic tool because uh, my experience and my um, and, and in, there is some experience in the literature that suggests that this may be more sensitive and specific than EMGs or any other electrophysiology. Um, things like testing, doing the EAST test, doing physical strength testing, um, and we will actually do physical strength testing with a, a, um, a strength tester, a goniometer. Um, I don't want to do a shameless plug for the product but I also don't have any ownership in the product itself. So I have nothing to gain other than the satisfaction of seeing more people use it. Um, there's this thing called the grip X, um, which I use, which tests strength and you test the strength in different positions, arm up, arm down, left and right. And we see patients who their, their grip X strength correlates exactly with when they get their pain. Um, it's, uh, it's to me, the, it's the diagnostic correlation. And then we look at pre and post-op left to grip strength in the up and down position to see if it's getting better. And then we can focus the physiotherapy on improving, you know, the different strength, uh, the muscles that are affected. Michael, thank you for that question. Michael is a patient we're familiar with. Um, how much does technology play a part in what you see in the future? You showed some really cool 3D models. How do you uh, think the technology system? can't be ignored. Um, technology is part of the solution. Um, we are, you know, for example, I, I've been, I started using a, a new type of uh, imaging, intraoperative imaging called the exascope, uh, which is a great way of looking at um, the area and the angle of what we're looking at, similar to an operating microscope, um, but it's able to be done with in, uh, in angles that a microscope would really find, have difficulty doing. Um, and so that, that's actually a potential uh, new um, area of interest. Uh, endoscopes uh, can be very useful. Um, I, I love doing the 3D modeling, as you've seen. Uh, I think that there are um, you know, custom retractors that we're designing and developing. 
Uh, and then, you know, who knows what the next technologies are going to be that's going to make our lives easier. And the odds are it's already been discovered. It's already being used in some other field, maybe not even in medicine. Um, and it's just going to take somebody with an open mind to see it and say, huh, that'd be awesome in, in my TOS surgeries. That's, this is the way I view MRI for TOS. It's been used for years before I got involved. It's a great right. tool that someone else invented. Look at Jeff Bezos, right? He got rich. He didn't invent the internet. <laughs> Nor did he invent shopping. No, that's right. Good point. <laughs> but he figured out how to use one tool. He figured out how to do it better. To revolutionize the other. Yep. So you wrote a paper, which is actually how I first met you when you published this paper. Uh, it was one patient with a cervical rib, I believe, and you did microsurgery. Do you want to describe how you came up with that? Um, well, that was, you know, just a, a referral from uh, one of my hand surgeons who had this young lady with a very bad uh, progressive problem. Not only was her hand becoming atrophic and losing muscle in her hand from the chronic compression on the nerve, um, but her pain was so bad she couldn't exercise, she couldn't run. Just the, the pounding of running aggravated this problem for her in such a way that it really it was taking away her quality of life. Um, and a, a year after her surgery, she sent us a big uh, thank you to, uh, telling us she ran the New York Marathon. Ah, great. What a reward. What a nice feeling. Yeah. Why did you decide on that to come up with a new technique rather than to do a standard technique? Well, I had done the standard technique in the past, and as I had learned these other minimally invasive techniques, um, I didn't know that these minimally invasive techniques at the time that I did that had done the, this prior, because these are rare, cervical ribs are pretty rare. Um, and when this presented itself to me, I said, you know what, this isn't, I don't need to do it the old way. I have a better way. I've been doing, you know, this technique for, uh, procedures even one level lower for uh, T12 rib, um, doing T12 uh, thoracic discs. And it really would be this, it's the exact same operation that I would do for that to do this, except I just drill out the rib instead of drilling out part of the rib to get down to the disc level. I would just keep going straight ahead and take out all of the rib. Um, and it worked and it worked great. Um, she went home the same day. So that's great. So you use a pre-existing tool in a new way, Jeff Bezos. Now, <clears throat> we do get a lot of patients that either don't believe they have TOS or get put off for months or years because they have a negative EMG study. Right. You mentioned that there are patients who have motor nerve damage and it's kind of permanent. Do you want to describe that in a little more detail, why EMG is only positive in that subset, really? Well, EMGs are only positive when the the nerve compression is bad enough that the muscle weakness emg is the electromyography and it really shows primarily um, nerve permanent nerve dysfunction causing permanent muscle dysfunction um, in reversible situations where the compression is intermittent and the symptoms are intermittent um, the emgs are often negative even during the periods of pain. As long as the, the compression can be relieved, the irritation on the muscle can be relieved and the muscle can kind of recover. Um, we see this in disc herniations all the time. Um, nobody would call uh, somebody with um, a disc herniation that's EMG was negative, but they have um, maybe even a partial foot drop, but with a negative EMG, or even if they don't have a foot drop, but they have severe radiating pain that goes down to their big toe, um, and they've got a four or five disc herniation that's huge and causing compression. It's like, if it looks like a duck, sounds like a duck, it's a duck. Um, nobody would call that, that, nobody would call that. With yeah, the but, symptomatology, with a yeah, physical yeah. exam. Yeah, but nobody would call that disputed sciatica. Yeah. You know, that it's just, it's inconceivable that you would say EMG negative means it's that the diagnosis is in dispute. It just means it, it's better to be negative on your EMGs for long-term outcomes because that means you don't have permanent nerve damage. There you go. So people, once they get to an EMG positive, what Asa Wilborn, this neurologist said was his criterion 
for diagnosing true neurogenic TOS. That's great. So you diagnose it, you're sure of the diagnosis because you waited to the end stage. Correct. And operate on these patients, then they won't get better. And, and you're sure they won't do as well than as if you had treated it before they had yeah. permanent nerve damage and probably some atrophy. Right. They'll have permanent disability. So right. our job as doctors is not to find cancer when it's stage four. Right. Cancer when it's early. Yeah, exactly. Nobody would call stage two cancer disputed cancer. Right. I'll wait till metastases show up in your lungs and your liver and then I'll Then we'll be sure. Yeah. And then of course there won't be any treatment. So But um, you'll be sure of the diagnosis. Right. And that's the point. You can be sure of the diagnosis, but it's a useless yeah. diagnosis. Correct. That that's point. not the way I want to practice medicine. Right. So again, I'm very enlightened. I hope all our viewers are too. It's just always just very stimulating when you uh present. And I look forward to doing this again. Thank you so much. Thanks, Scott. Great. Take care. Take care.